Good morning, everybody. Hello and welcome. It's going to be a good day for music. Good day for. I'm, I'm, I'm yammering while I pick stuff up I've dropped. It's going to be a good day for worshiping the Lord. Hello and welcome. Would you mind standing with us as we, as we? We're going to start off today with the Christmas song. Does that sound okay? And it's one we're certain you know. The herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic. Welcome to Cornerstone Church, where our mission is to be a loving family of faith who joyfully responds to God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's just so good to see everyone today. Um, as you know, I've been gone for a couple weeks, and what's that saying? That uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder, and I really missed you all, and I'm so grateful that uh, the Rasmussen family can be here and, and worship together in, in physical presence with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. So um, we got to enjoy the service from home, and so we're grateful for the uh, opportunity to, to worship online as well. And for those of you who are worshiping online today, we're glad that you're a part of our, our church today and part of this worship service. And we pray that it'll bring God honor and glory and we'll praise the coming of our, our Savior Jesus the Christ this Advent season. Uh, a couple things to share. Um, the men are going to have our Bible study this Wednesday. We're going to look at Luke chapter 2 as we're getting close to Christmas. We just thought it'd be appropriate for us to uh, look at that text. And then we'll take a break after this Wednesday until after the New Year. And I think we're going to pick up on Ephesians after the New Year. So we're actually moving to the New Testament after a couple solid years of being in the Old Testament. But uh, looking forward to spending time with the guys this, this Wednesday morning. Um, PYM Squared is, is also going by Zoom. And Pastor DJ is kind of uh, doing an impromptu ministry right now, just kind of reaching out to some of the youth. And it's really been beautiful how he's been connecting with people and encouraging them in their faith right now. Some kids are going through some hard times. And it's been really great for him to be an ambassador for Christ to them. So we praise God for that. Um, for the Christmas season, we have a couple really wonderful ministry opportunities, a couple wonderful ways for us to show the love of Christ to people and celebrate Christmas. One of them is the giving tree that we have outside the door that uh, we're doing in connection with the four-day movement. I just want to ask DJ to come up here for a minute and just kind of give, some, give us some details about what the giving tree is all about. So, Good morning, everybody. God bless you. Outside is a tree, and on that tree are some 40 movement ornaments. And some of you have already taken some of those, and some of you hopefully will be taking some of those. They have um, descriptions of Christmas gifts that are warranted by um, some families. So if you have a heart to do that, we have a giving tree out here, and you are to go and to purchase the um, items and then bring them back in a gift bag, if you would, or in some kind of a bag with the ornament attached to it so we know how to describe the family. And then we'll distribute those next week. So thank you so very much. Um, the last day to um, get an ornament, I think we extended it through Wednesday. 
to bring them back yet. So if you'll get an ornament today, bring the gift back by Wednesday, and they'll be distributed all by Friday in time for Christmas. So thank you very much for anybody that does take an ornament. And for anybody that you know that does need some assistance with Christ Christmas, please come and see us. We've had some other um, toy donations, and there was a Zumbadon done, and we were able to raise almost $1,000 with that for gift cards and toys. So please, um, if you would, uh, if you'd be a part of that, or if you know somebody, please let us know. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pastor DJ. Uh, the other thing we're doing for Christmas this year, you know, in past years we've supported the, the Wiseman Ministry, which is a beautiful ministry that the YMCA does, and they um, collect funds and organize a ministry to purchase Christmas presents for a whole variety of families throughout Wayne County, and it's really wonderful. Um, they're, they're still doing it this year, but it's, uh, it's kind of... Um, they've kind of had to alter it due to COVID and their financial situation and so forth. And as a session, we just felt led this year, rather than support, uh, we may still offer a financial contribution to Wiseman, but we want to focus our attention a little bit differently this year. And we thought it would be really nice to support a particular family that has a direct relationship with our church. And you guys know Junior and Freddie here, they're with, uh, with Dr. Gallagher over there. And uh, these two kids have been part of our family of faith for years. Uh, they bring a lot of life and vitality to our church, a lot of joy to our church. Uh, many of you know Maria and Eric. They've worshiped with us many times also. And then they have another older brother also. And so the five kids live with mom in a little trailer home, and it's not in great shape. And we just thought it'd be a great way to express the love of Christ to kind of help this family out. Mom works hard. She has a job, single parent, five kids in the home, and the house is in pretty rough shape. So we'd like to just um, try to support them this year, help them to find a little bit of a better place, a little better quality of life. And so if you are willing to offer some contributions towards um, helping them move into a little nicer place, that'd be a great way to express the love of Christ this year for Christmas. So um, please pray about that. And so that along with the giving tree are two wonderful ways for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus this Christmas season. Um, today is the third week of Advent, and we celebrated the, uh, the blessing of hope that we have in Christ in the first week, uh, the blessing of, excuse me, yeah, of hope the first week, peace the second week, and today we're doing love. And we're, I've kind of switched the order of Advent this week, or this year, uh, because it follows the chapters of Ruth better to, to go with hope, peace, love today, and then joy. And so I'd like to invite uh, Taylor and Vicki to come on up. Uh, Taylor's going to read from Psalm 33, and Vicki's going to light the Advent candle celebrating the love that we have in Christ Jesus. Truly the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. I'll start over. Truly the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Please join me in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, truly, um, we thank you for your love given to us in Christ Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that in celebrating the birth of your Son, our Savior Jesus the Christ, we are celebrating the most profound and most beautiful expression of love that you could ever show humanity, uh, the very giving of yourself. And we thank you, Lord God, that in Jesus' promised return, he's going to come with all the love that you have for us. And that as you create a new heaven and a new earth, you're going to rescue us from the pain and the heartache and the schisms and the separation and the despondency and despair that we often <clears throat> feel in this world because of sin and because of brokenness. We thank you, Lord, that we'll experience the full measure of your love when Jesus comes back to make all things right. And so today, Lord God, we give our hearts to worship you. We celebrate your love for us. And as we sing your praises and offer these prayers and share fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ, as we hear your word read and proclaimed, we give our hearts to share how much we love you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please, and join us? When I became a Christian, I had the mistaken notion 
that any song about God or about Jesus was a Christmas song about our Savior. So this is our Christmas song for now. Oh Lord my God When I in awesome wonder Consider all the works thy hand hath made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee How great Thou I think the volume is extraordinarily loud. Okay, it's it's fine. Now it's gone. Thank 
sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. Noel, 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 Noel. Born is the King of Israel. They looked up and saw. church. I so love this time of the worship service because we get to come before you with the prayers of the people. And Father, before I even get to those, I just want to say how great thou art. How great you are. How great you are. Are there any unspoken prayer requests this morning? If you would just lift your hand so we as a church body know that we need to be praying for you. I see those hands. I see them. I see them. Thank you very much. I see them. And I hope that you all saw the hands of our people. For those that are out on the airwaves this morning, please know that you're being prayed for as well. For those that are watching via YouTube or whatever element online, we are going to be praying for you as well. Our country's going through a lot. We are as individuals and we as families, we as cities, we as a nation are going through a lot. But God is God. God is God. Would you join me in prayer? Good morning, Lord, how great you are. Oh, how great you are. Father, with a sincere heart, we come before you, dear Lord, and we ask that you please hear, hear our prayers. For, Father, there's a lot going on in our nation, in our country, in our state, in our city, in our homes, in our families, inside of us. But thank you for, for being the God of all. Heavenly Father, this morning we lift up Gina and Brianna Ponzi, who are both pregnant. Father, thank you for being with them during their pregnancies. Thank you, dear Lord, that you would bring them peace and calmness during this time as they carry sweet little people. Protect their health, dear Lord, and protect the babies. We ask this. Heavenly Father, we lift up Cody and the health issues that he has had. Thank you, Lord, that through all of them, you have had your hand upon him. And thank you, dear Lord, that all the treatments are working, dear Lord. And thank you that he finds peace even in the midst of his struggle. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that you are the vaccine for COVID-19. We thank you that it is going away. In Jesus' name. May this plague be lifted from us. In Jesus' name. May healing be all over our land in Jesus' name. May you bring us comfort all over this land in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I thank you that this pandemic has been nothing more than just an eye-opening experience for us as Christ followers. And that we will get back to our first love, which is you. 
And Father, for those who have had to experience some of the effects of this, this situation, this circumstance, this sickness, <coughs> thank you, Lord, for healing. Thank you, Lord, for healing us spiritually, for healing our souls, and for healing our physical body. Lord, we thank you for the giving tree that is outside those doors. And thank you, Lord, that every family that has something upon those trees will be blessed by every gift that comes into their home. And that they will have a heart of gratitude. And through that gift, you will manifest all over it, dear Lord, within will be more than them just receiving a physical item, but from that they will feel the spirit that came behind the giving. And then maybe they just might be spurned to give themselves. Heavenly Father, we lift up the Gomez family. Thank you, dear Lord, for what you have done and what you are doing in their lives, Lord. Lord, they have lost, they have had challenges, dear Lord, but yet you are still their God, and we thank you for that, our God. Lord God, as they prepare for their new home, we consecrate it before it is ever bought. We thank you for it, that every threshold that they step through, they will feel your spirit there. And in every room of that house, there will be peace, there will be joy, there will be love and a lot of hope in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I lift up my mom, whose back is continuing to heal. And Father, to see her upright and smiling is such a blessing. So please be with her, Lord, as she continues to rehab. And thank you that it is going well. And for others who have had any kind of surgery or any kind of hospitalization, thank you, dear Lord, that you are in the midst of their situation and that you're in the midst of their healing. In Jesus' name. Lord, for Kenneth Braswell's niece, um, Mary, Lord, right, she passed away from cancer, Lord, and so we remember their family right now. In the midst of their mourning, in the midst of their discomfort, in the midst of their tears, we remember them right now. Thank you for being in the midst of that. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, for our PYM youth, our PYM squared youth, and you know specifically who it is who lost her birth mother. Lord, heal her heart. Heal her right now, dear Lord, as she just works through some things. And thank you for the guardians that you have placed in her life to be a blessing to her. And Lord God, for our pastor, I would thank you that you continue to heal him day we are very thankful for the word that he will bring forth. Lord God, utilize him, dear Lord, to bring something that will resonate in our hearts, dear Lord. And we thank you for the word that he will bring and that we would hide in our hearts that we may not sin against thee. Heavenly Father, I pray that hope and peace and love and joy will reign during this Christmas season. For it's not the toys, it's not the hustle and bustle, you are the reason for the season. We believe what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Pastor DJ. Um, there was a couple other things I meant to mention during the announcements and I forgot. The first of all is this is the first time I've been back in the sanctuary worshiping with you all since the Christmas uh, decorations have been up, and it's so beautiful. So I want to thank you so much to the ladies that put up the Christmas tree and all the ornaments and the beautiful candles and just all the, the, the pine and the decorations. It really uh, makes the season come alive and um, helps us to um, celebrate the, the birth of our Savior. Um, the other thing is, uh, I forgot to mention during the announcements, is we have Polly with us today. and Just really grateful for you as uh, Polly's going to play the piano. She played last week and did a beautiful job. And um, it's just so nice that uh, Taylor and Vicki do such a great job leading our worship services up here, but it's also nice to kind of supplement that with the use of the piano, and you know, Madeline Precise was so generous in giving us that piano a couple years ago, and it's just a great thing that we can use it and use other people's gifts uh, to bring glory to our Savior as we worship in different forms and different ways. So just so grateful for that. So thank you so much for being here today, Polly, and for the coals that we sing in later. Um, this is the third week of Advent, and as I mentioned before, we're going through the book of Ruth. It works beautifully because there are four chapters in the book of Ruth, and each of the four chapters coincides really well with the themes of, of hope, peace, love, and joy. And so today we're going to look at the theme of love, and we're going to look at it uh, as we read Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 through 18, and, and consider how um, this text and the lives of Ruth and Boaz point us to the amazing love that God offers us in Jesus Christ. So listen carefully now as I read Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, 
My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz with whose young women you've been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he'll tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me I will do. So Ruth went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and he was in a contented mood, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of the grain, and she came up stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled, and he turned over, and there lying at his feet was a woman. And he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. He said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. For all the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman. But now, though it is true that I am a near kinsman, there is another kinsman more closely related than I. Remain this night, and in the morning, if he will act as next of kin for you, good, let, it, let him do it. If he is not willing to act as next of kin for you, then, as the Lord lives, I will act as next of kin for you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but got up before one person could recognize another, for he said, it must not be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. Then he said, bring the cloak you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her back. Then he went into the city. She came to her mother-in-law, who said, well, how did things go with you, my daughter? She, she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, he gave me these six measures of barley, for he said, do not go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah, so week one, we looked at uh, Ruth chapter one and saw how um, Naomi and Ruth didn't have anything. <laughs> they left Moab with nothing except for maybe a, a sack of stuff, and, and that's it. All they had was the hope that as they went to Bethlehem, that somehow God would provide for them. God would, God would meet their needs. And then in chapter two, we saw how Boaz was so generous to Ruth and provided a means for her to glean and, and meet the, her physical needs. And, and that took away the anxiety and the fear that they were going to starve to death. And in a, in a limited way, then they had some measure of peace. But beyond that, Ruth discovered that through this relationship with the God of Israel, she has this deep, abiding peace that reaches deep into her heart. And then uh, Boaz showed her incredible kindness and generosity and, and welcomed her by allowing her to eat and drink with her other, his other workers. And she discovered this peace of being in right relationship with other people. And through that relationship with God and others, she developed this inner peace, this sense of security, this understanding of who she is in relationship to God and God's people. And so chapter 2 is really about peace. Well, today we're looking at love. Chapter 3 is all about love. And the story is almost like, it's like a Hallmark movie. You got these two godly people who are doing the right thing, making the right choices, and they're drawn to each other. You can just feel the love in the air, right? It's like a Hallmark movie. It's really beautiful. But, but the story is about so much more than just a man and a woman being attracted to one another and how this romance is developing. Because their relationship with each other really serves to point us to this deeper and more enduring relationship, this eternal relationship that God offers his people as God shows us just how great his love is for us. And so as we begin chapter 3, it's pretty clear that Boaz and Ruth admire each other. We've seen noble characteristics in both of them in the first two chapters. But neither one of them at this point is willing to uh, make a move, so to speak. Neither one of them is willing to, to be assertive enough to try to enter into a, a romantic relationship with the other. They, they need some help. And, uh, and Naomi is all too glad to step forward and be kind of a matchmaker, so to speak. You know, they, they, they admire each other, but they're not willing to take a risk. They're not willing to step forward and 
try to initiate this relationship. You know, we've, we've learned so far in the story that Boaz is a generous man. He's a noble man. Um, he, he overcame what social mores, social expectations by, you know, she, he ignored the, the fact that, that, that Naomi is this Moabite, she's unclean, she's from this people that has this history of being antagonistic towards the Israelites. He ignored all that, and he, he welcomes her to his property. He not only allows her to glean, but he provides extra grain for her. He tells his men to make sure she's protected. Um, he tells her to stay close to the women. Um, he invites her to have fellowship with his workers. You know, not just, we're not just going to make sure your, your stomach's full, but you're going to come and be in relationship with us. He, he welcomes her to, to eat and drink with them, even though she's considered unclean by the people. Um, she, he blesses her. He pronounces God's blessings upon her. And so all these ways, Boaz reveals himself to be an, an admirable and, and, and noble man. And, and Ruth, obviously, is really grateful for this. And she shows this great, tremendous amount of respect and admiration for him. In chapter 2, it says, She fell prostrate with her face on the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? And so it's, it's really clear to us that Ruth is deeply impressed with Boaz. But it's also inappropriate for a woman to try to approach a man in the society. That just that didn't happen. They barely even spoke to each other in public unless they had good reason. There's no way she's going to try to approach him for, you know, to kind of initiate this a romantic relationship. And you got to remember also that her entire livelihood depends upon the generosity and kindness of this man. She doesn't want to, what, offend him or estrange herself from him or anything like that. She, he's this wealthy landowner, this elder who serves in the city gate, who has all this uh, respect from, from the people. He's this man of uh, authority, and she's just a little peasant girl. You know, she's just a, a Moabite, a stranger and a foreigner. And so she's not going to dare mess this up by approaching Boaz. Um, and Boaz, you might think, well, maybe he should be, take the initiative. Maybe he should start this relationship. And you might expect that. So he's the man. He's the person in authority. He's the, the, the civilian in the area. Um, he's the one that's shown her kindness and provided for her. Um, and uh, he has every reason to be attracted to Ruth. I mean, Ruth is shown to be a person of tremendous courage, leaving her homeland to go to a foreign place where she knows she's probably be well received. She shows incredible devotion to Naomi. She cares for this older woman. She works hard. She goes out in the fields and, and gleans, working all day. She shows incredible humility to Boaz, respect for him. Um, she's a, proven to be a person of faith. Even though she's a Moabite, she's come to believe in the God of Israel. Um, she, this is a woman of integ integrity and character and faith and humility. Is just, and besides that, she's obviously attractive because Naomi said, you know, earlier in chapter 1, she said, just stay in, in Moab and you can marry someone else. You know, you get the sense that she's a young and beautiful woman that just could have very easily found a husband. And so Boaz is, is attracted to her. He has plenty of reasons to be drawn to her. But the thing about Boaz is he's an older man. Apparently he's never been married. We don't know anything about his, his history. And it just seems like he can't believe that Ruth would be interested in an old man like him. You know, he, he doesn't want to look like an old fool chasing after this young, beautiful woman. And so he kind of hides behind his, his dignity, his, his respected you know, uh, exterior, and is just unable to, unwilling to, to make a move. And so Naomi kind of forces their hand. She places the matchmaker, and she works to bring these two people together. And... Um, Neither Ruth nor Boaz feel like they're worthy of the other one. And, you know, that's, that can really be a characteristic of a, a beautiful, wonderful relationship between a man and a woman. If the man feels like, oh, I, I'm just not worthy of her. I, I can't believe she would want to be with me. And conversely, if the woman feels that way, I can't believe he would want to be with me. And I'm, I'm not worthy of him. You know, assuming that the, the, each individual has a healthy, you know, um, healthy perspective of themselves, you know, good self-worth, so, you know, they're not beating themselves down. But they just have this feeling, I'm really not worthy of that person. When each person feels that way, that's the makings of a strong, beautiful relationship with each is humble before the other, and just grateful that the other would want to be with, with them. That's a beautiful thing. But the problem is, if you're unwilling to take that step, if you're unwilling to take the risk of potentially being rejected by the other, the relationship is not going to happen. And so the first thing we see in a loving relationship is 
The individual needs to be willing to risk being rejected by the other for the relationship to begin and for love to be experienced. And um, Naomi has to prompt Ruth, you know, here's this man is respected elder in the gate, rich, powerful. You got to just take this chance and just go for it. And, and, and okay, so the situation was they had harvested the barley, right? And they go down to the threshing floor, and the men work from the time the sun is up in the morning till it goes down at night. They work the whole day to work to separate the, the barley from the stalks and the chaff. And they work until sundown, then they eat, and then they just sleep right there. They just work right at the work site, they just go to sleep right there. And of course, Naomi knows this, so she tells Ruth, okay, this is what you do. You wait till the sun goes down, till everyone falls asleep, everything's quiet, no one's paying attention. And then go up to, make sure you know which one Bo is Boaz. <laughs> don't, don't, don't go the wrong guy. Find where Boaz is at, uncover his feet, and lay there. And, of course, the idea is that he'll feel her presence, and he'll wake up. And she's taking a huge risk by doing this. You think about this. Um, a woman going to a, bunch of, going to a man in the middle of the night, she could be, if she was caught by someone else, that could be seen as a scandalous kind of thing, right? What is she trying to do? Is she trying to seduce this guy? Is she acting like a prostitute? And, and you remember, she's a Moabite, and the Moabites have a history of seducing the Israelite men, you know, so that would, it would be disastrous if she was caught by someone else. She's taking a huge risk to approach him. But by going at night, assuming no one else sees what's going on, she can approach Boaz in a subtle way, in a humble way. She's not... You know, a woman would never approach a man in this society. She can't do this openly in the daylight where other people would be critical of her and they'd think badly of her. But she can go in the middle of the night, he wakes up, and now it's up to Boaz how he's going to respond. Ruth is basically saying, I'm available. I, I, would, I would love to marry you. She, but she can't make the first move, so she's making herself available so that he knows. And this, she's taking that risk of being rejected, but she's willing to do that for the sake of love. And um, now it's up to Boaz and how he's going to respond. Ruth boldly comes uh, to, to Boaz in the middle of the night, and then she has to wait to see um, what he's going to do, how, how he's going to respond. Now, <laughs> there's an interesting little detail in this text where it's strange. It's like, what is going on here when Naomi tells Ruth to uncover his feet? Okay? And this part of the text kind of aggravates me because there are scholars that think this means that something scandalous is going on. There, there are actually a couple situations in the Bible where the word feet is used as a euphemism to refer to another appendage found uniquely in the male anatomy. And yeah, I had a, a liberal Old Testament professor in seminary who insisted that when Ruth uncovered Boaz's feet, she was uncovering something else, right? And, you know... That, and basically, my Old Testament professor was, was advocating premarital sex. You know, the, the women are in a powerless situation, and the only thing they can do is seduce the man. So it's, it's perfectly okay in these circumstances to have a roll in the hay before they're married in order to get him to want to marry her, right? Um, and it just frustrated me that a professor in the Old Testament in my seminary would, would basically be advocating premarital relationships and it completely ignores the fact that throughout this text, Boaz is presented as a noble man, as one who loves the Lord. And Ruth also, he says, you are a worthy woman. They, they do everything with dignity. They do everything with respect. They seek to honor the Lord in their relationship with um, each other. And then on top of that, um, after Boaz realizes that Ruth is there and she's been laying at his feet, Boaz says, there is another kinsman more closely related than I. Remain this night in the and in the morning, if he will act as kinsman, as next of kin for you, good, let him do it. If not, if he's unwilling to act as next of kin, then as the Lord lives, I will act as next of kin. And so basically Boaz is saying, there's someone who has the right to marry you before I do, and I can't believe that they would take a roll in the hay, and then he's going to say, oh, by the way, there's someone else that should be marrying you, and we'll see what he thinks. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. So what, what we get from this, what we should get from this text, is that both Boaz and Ruth seek to honor the Lord first. They love the Lord first, and then their love for their Lord and their desire to honor him instructs and informs how they're going to be in relationship to each other. 
And so the second thing I pick up from this text is that our love for a man or a woman must first be directed by our love for the Lord. You know, if you want, if you seek to love the Lord first and let your love for Lord for the Lord and your desire to um, please God instruct your relationship with your romantic interest with that man or that woman, then you're going you're gonna to live in wisdom. You're going to have a, a relationship that's built on a foundation of rock. You're going to seek to love the other person before yourself. Now, if you try to pursue a relationship with that romantic interest without regard for the Lord, I'm going to do the things my way instead of God's way, you're going to end up making foolish decisions. And decisions are going to be self-centered. They're going to be directed on my interests rather than on what the Lord wants. It's a pursuit of self-gratification rather than a pursuit of honoring God. And the result of that is that the relationship is going to be self-centered. It's going to be based on selfishness, and it's not going to be a healthy, strong relationship. And those kinds of relationships often end in disaster. So Boaz and Ruth aren't like that. They're seeking to honor the Lord first. And what comes out of that is a desire to comfort and protect and provide for the other. And so when Ruth is at um, Boaz's feet, Boaz is startled. She says, I'm Ruth. And what does she say? Uh, Put your cloak over me. And by putting his cloak over her, it's a symbolic gesture. I mean, she's, he's obviously keeping her warm, physically warm, and showing some love and compa- compassion for her. But beyond that, it's a symbolic gesture saying, I'm going to comfort you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. Uh, let me make the arrangements. I've got to talk to this other guy that first has legal rights to be your kinsman redeemer. But I'm going to do this. I'm going to pursue this so I can meet your needs. And Ruth, on the other hand, she wants to comfort Boaz, this man who's older man who's never been married, who's been all alone, she wants to comfort him and love him. She wants to provide for him with, with a child, with, 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 with an heir. And um, so they seek to meet one another's needs. Now, I feel like I should um, explain kind of the details of what's going on a little bit here first before I go any further. Um, so remember, Naomi was married to Elimelech. Elimelech died. They had two sons. Both the sons died. Now remember, for the people of Israel, the promised land was given to the nation, and it was like subdivided among the clans and among the families, and each particular family had their own piece of land. But now because Naomi is a widow with no husband and no sons and no children, there's there's no one to legally assume the property that belonged to Elimelech. And because Elimelech doesn't have any children, there's, there's no one to inherit the land, there's no one to carry on his name. And so what the Israelites did in response to situations like that was the next closest living relative had the responsibility, the legal responsibility, to assume ownership of the land. And then they were to, in order, so to make sure that the women were taken care of and they weren't just neglected, they weren't just abandoned, they were kind of inherited along with the land. And so the nearest relative was to inherit the land, provide for Naomi as an older widow, but then also because Ruth is this younger woman that doesn't have any children, he's essentially to marry her and to provide children through Ruth so that the land would continue to belong to Elimelech's line, Elimelech's name would be carried on, and his family would continue to, to own the land for an for, for indefinite period of time. Now, so the nearest of kin has the first right to do this. He, he's supposed to do it, but if he decides to neglect his duties or to pass it on to the next person, Boaz is the next in line. And Boaz is the one who's eager to marry Ruth. And and he's eager to take on this responsibility of caring for Naomi and continuing Elimelech's line. And so the, the, the fourth point we see in this text is that when we love someone, we enthusiastically pursue that love. We've already seen how enthusiastically Ruth pursued Boaz by risking humiliation, risking her reputation by going to the threshing floor and, and laying at his feet and, and just offering herself in this just really beautifully humble way. We saw how she pursued him. Now we're going to see in chapter 4 how Ruth so en- or how Boaz so enthusiastically pursues Ruth. The, as soon as the sun goes up, bam, he's, away, he's out running from the threshing floor. He's going to the city gate. He's going to gather 10 elders to make this a legal transaction. He's going to talk to the nearest of kin to persuade him so that he can be the one who marries Ruth. And what we see from this is that when you love someone, you enthusiastically pursue that person, pursue that relationship. And the text ends with Naomi telling Ruth, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Boaz is going to get the girl. 
He is determined. And so again, this is a beautiful story. It's a, it's a Hallmark kind of story where uh, there's this warm, good feeling story about how this woman, this man love each other. But it, it's so much deeper than that because it points us to the ways, many of the ways that God loves us. Jesus loves us. The first point I made in the text was that love requires the risk of being rejected, right? Ruth risked being rejected by going to the threshing floor and potentially humiliating herself or having Boaz just say, I don't want you. Boaz risks rejection by going to the city gate and publicly declaring he wants to marry Ruth in front of these 10 elders and the people of the city and and the the next of kin to have said, no, I want her, and then he would have been heartbroken. He risked that for the sake of, of this relationship. But what do we see in God? God is an incredible, astounding thing where the creator of the universe who's, who's up there in the kingdom of heaven chose to come down to us in the person of Jesus Christ. God was willing to risk rejection from us in order to show how much he loves us. And he endured that rejection. I mean, he had people during his ministry um, claiming that he was uh, possessed by Beelzebul, a prince of demons. His own family members thought he was crazy. And he was rejected in the harshest and most violent ways possible when he was arrested and spat upon and beat it, beaten and he was flogged and had this, the thorns, the crown of thorns pressed into his skull and then of course he was, he was crucified. He, he endured rejection in, in the most violent and horrible ways possible. Even today, Jesus endures rejection as people dismiss him, people mock him, they make fun of Jesus, disregard him. He did all that so that he could show us how much he loves us by dying on the cross for us. And he he did all that to make it possible for us to truly love him by removing the barrier of sin between us and him. Even God had to risk rejection in order to experience love between us and him. The second point I made was that our love for one another must be directed by our love for the Lord, right? Boaz had to make decisions in a way that honors God in order to be in relationship with, with Ruth, and Ruth the same, likewise. And if we have a truly loving, deep relationship with our romantic other, um, it's first directed by our love and our submission to God. And that's even true of Jesus. Jesus couldn't just come into the world and and love us however he chose, the way he wanted to do it. He had to submit his will to the Father. And remember, at the beginning of his earthly ministry, he was tempted by the devil, right? And one of the temptations the devil gave him was, if you bow before me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And it would have been so easy for Jesus to say, yeah, I want to be in control. I want to have power. I want to be the king of all, all the world. And then I'll be, I'll be in, he could, he could justify it by saying, well, I'm in power. Now I can bless my people however I want. I can show them from this position of power I can love my people however I choose. And even when the nation of Israel saw the miracles Jesus were, was performing, what did they want to do? They wanted to make him king by force. And Jesus had to run away because, again, he could have been made the king. And from a position of power, he could have could have justified that by saying, I can love my people and give them whatever they need. I can make sure that everything they have, everything they they need, they have. But Jesus doesn't do that. He submits himself to the will of the Father, to the Father's authority, so that he can love us as God intends. And that turns out to be the best possible thing for us. Because Jesus coming in the role of a servant, being willing to die on the cross for us, results in him paying the penalty for our sins. Removing that barrier between us sinful people and a holy and perfect God is the only thing that makes it possible for us to be in a truly loving relationship with the creator of the universe. And of course, through his resurrection, he conquers death, he goes to the right hand of the Father, and he makes it possible for us to be in a loving relationship with God forever, for for all of eternity. And then the, um, the third point I made was that Love provides comfort and protection and provision for the other. Uh, Boaz pr- is going to comfort as, she, as he puts the cloak around Ruth. He shows he's going to protect her. He's going to comfort her. He's going to provide for her. He's going to meet her needs. Ruth, on the other hand, she wants to sh- comfort Boaz in his, in his older age as he's been without a relationship. He's been alone. She wants to provide a child for him. And they love each other in this way. And the same is true of God, the, the way he loves us. He he comforts us through the work of the Holy Spirit. He comforts us through forgiving us and accepting us in spite of our sin. He he protects us from the evil one, right? Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer that that we'll be protected from the evil one. Um, He provides for us hope, like DJ prayed so beautifully. We celebrate this Advent season. He provides for us peace, hope, love, and joy. 
And of course, he provides us the gift of eternal life. And then the, the final point I made was that we enthusiastically pursue the one we love. Because Ruth was in love with Boaz. He longed, she longed for him to be her husband. She goes to the threshing floor and risks everything in order to make this subtle proposal to him. And Boaz, because he loves Ruth so much, he enthusiastically runs to the city gate. As soon as the sun comes up, he runs the gate. He gathers the elders. He makes this plan to try to persuade the next of kin to bypass his rights so that Boaz can be the one who can marry her and show his love for her. And it's such an astounding thing that God would pursue us. He would enthusiastically come from the, 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 the far distance of heaven and come down to earth to show his love for us. And um, he risks everything to pursue us so that we can be in a loving relationship with him. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The cross brought him unbearable misery and pain, but he was willing to endure it and endure it with joy because he knew the result would be he'd be sitting at the right hand of the Father. Our sins, for those of us who trust in him, will be forgiven and we'll be able to experience the full measure of his love. And so if we truly love Jesus, what are we going to do? We're going to enthusiastically pursue a relationship with him, right? Jesus is not an afterthought for us. Jesus is not of secondary importance. Jesus is not something we just do on Sundays once in a while when we feel like it. When we love God, we pursue Jesus with all of our hearts. We come together as God's people and we celebrate the love we have for him in worship. We wake up every morning and we say to ourselves, what can I do today to show my love for my Lord? We live each day with the eager anticipation that Jesus is going to come back and we will be in his presence and we'll be able to love him forever. And so Boaz shows us this great love for Ruth as he runs the city gate and, um, and praises her uh, before the people. Uh, Ruth shows this incredible love for Boaz as she dares boldly and humbly dares to go before him in the threshing floor. Boaz declares his love for her. He celebrates his love for her when he says, may you be blessed by the Lord. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. It's like she was loyal to Naomi. That was a beautiful thing. It's amazing that she left Moab and went all the way to Bethlehem to be with Naomi. But your loyalty to me is even better. It's even greater. And I celebrate that today. And so chapter three is a bit like a Hallmark movie. It's this feel-good love story between a man and a woman. But it's so much more than that. It points us to the love that we're called to have for Christ and that Jesus has for us. May we be like Ruth, who humbly but boldly um, goes to the feet of our Lord, seeking a relationship with him. May we be like Boaz, who joyfully and enthusiastically declares uh, the, our love for God, that we'll bless him and give thanks for his loyalty that's so much greater than anything else. Thanks be to God for what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for his love for us. Amen. Our offering text for today is from Luke chapter 11. And we see in this text how Jesus, um, he criticizes the Pharisees, but in so doing, he gives us instruction about the way we should give our offerings to the Lord. Uh, Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and herbs of all kinds and neglect justice and the love of God. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. So Jesus said, you ought to tithe, that's something you should do, but do in a way that you're practicing justice and you're celebrating the love of God. So may we give generously today of our tithes and offerings and may it be expression of the love we have for our Lord.
But your baby boy would save our sons and daughters. Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child. That your baby boy will give sight to the blind man. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kiss your baby, you have kissed the face of God. Mary, did you know? stand and let us profess what we believe uh, using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He shall come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we go from this place today, may we just go remembering and celebrating the incredible love that God has shown us in Jesus Christ. And as God has enthusiastically pursued us in giving his son to the world, may we enthusiastically pursue a relationship with God as we seek to love him with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind uh, for his glory. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. I'm going to tell you real quickly why we picked this song for you. We, we picked the music pretty carefully. 
Most of the time, sometimes we don't get it quite right. But this song is a, a very important song because this year has been a very hard year for everybody in this country. And I think most, most people are feeling stress. And it can come out in an awful lot of bad ways, health and, and other things. But it's important to know that we've got a Redeemer, especially at this time of the year. It's very important to consider these things, that despite the stress and the things we're experiencing, um, we have ultimate salvation and ultimate glory in, in, in our Father, our Heavenly Father, and the birth of Jesus. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. ourselves of this is anyone worthy is anyone home is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll the land of Judah Conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? Does the Father truly love us? He does. And does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah forever those He loves? He does. And does our God Is anyone worthy? Is anyone home? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root. And the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He is most a king and a priest to God to reign with the Son. And is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory?
peace, cornerstone.